Sacramento Masonic Lodge Number 40 is proud to welcome the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of California, very worshipful Alan Castellou. Worshipful Castellou's Masonic career began September 24th, 1991 in Merced, California. He is a recipient of the prestigious Hiram Award. He is a four times past master, president and CEO of the Knob Hill Masonic Center in San Francisco, secretary and or consultant of many, if not all associations, initiatives and campaigns managed and supported by the Grand Lodge of California. Tonight's topic is about Grand Lodge infrastructure, but more importantly, an inside look at the processes with the person who I consider one of the most influential Masons in the fraternity today. With that, I now declare this virtual chat room open and very worshipful Alan Castellou, welcome. Thank you, worshipful and good evening, brethren. It's nice to connect with you, uh, even if it has to be online uh, for now. And uh, certainly really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to the Lodge about the Grand Lodge. And uh, I was asked specifically to talk about the different Grand Lodge officers. And interestingly, in all these years I've been um, speaking to lodges. I've never been asked to talk about this subject before. So uh, I was thrilled to sort of put some thinking into this. And, uh, you know, our goal for the night is for uh, everyone to leave with a better understanding of the Grand Lodge and the officers of the Grand Lodge and, and what they do. Uh, but certainly um, feel free to ask questions at any time. And I think when we get toward the end of this, if you want to ask me about things that aren't necessarily directly related to this presentation, I'm happy to do that also. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, before we start that most uh, very worshipful. So a couple of things, um, you do some amazing work at Grand Lodge. Uh, I mean, you're the guy and that anybody who's anybody in the world of Freemasonry knows who you are. And I can only imagine how many ask for your guidance and seek approval on tons of projects throughout the course of the day. So before we dive into that, into this uh, infrastructure, can you tell us about the most exciting program that you're currently working on? Oh, the most exciting program we're currently working on. My goodness, there's there's several. Um, not the least of which is our reopening plan, which all of you are gonna hear about in about four or five days. Uh, so we are um, knee deep in that at the moment, uh, for sure. Um, so, and that's going to be just really welcome news, and that's going to be exciting because uh, before long we're going to be meeting in person again. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, the work that we're doing in the restoration program, I think, is really vital uh, right now. You know, 2020 was, um, you know, a year of disappointments in so many ways, and one of them was 2020 was going to be the year and would have been the year uh, that we turned around a 65 year membership decline in our organization. Uh, we were po poised to grow uh, for the first time in a long time. As it turned out, because our lodges weren't able to confer any degrees or take in any new members or affiliates after March, we had a net loss of membership of about 200 members which was, you know, for an organization that's been losing members for a long time, uh, it would have been a great milestone. And a big part of that was the restoration program. And uh, Grandmaster Weiss continued that this year. A hundred lodges are in the program now, thousands of members. Um, and we're gonna restore, um, you know, 800 to 1100 new member, you know, members this year again brothers who want to be connected to their lodge, um, who've lost track of their lodge in one way or another. So that's been uh, really exciting. Uh, believe it or not, we've managed to uh, create new lodges in this uh, COVID period. Um, we haven't been able to constitute them, uh, but we have done uh, virtual institutions. Lodges are the lifeblood of any Grand Lodge, right? Just like members are the lifeblood of a Lodge, Lodges are the lifeblood of a, of a Grand Lodge. And even though for years and years we had been losing Lodges almost by the dozens, over the last several years, we've actually been growing in the number of Lodges that we have in California. And um, we've got about five new Lodges ready to come on board. Uh, five lodges, uh, I believe, will be requesting charters at the annual communication. And so 
um, that's always exciting to create new lodges. It doesn't mean um, you know lodges that have been around a long time aren't also essential. They are, uh, but we all want new lodges and new life. We want lodges in cities and towns where a lodge doesn't currently exist, and we want them in towns that can uh, cities and towns that can accommodate more than one. Uh, a new thing that we've started this year uh, is really working to connect lodges to prospects. We get tens of thousands of prospects, uh, men around the state that are interested in becoming Masons, and we refer them to lodges, but there's a, there's a breakdown there. So many of them don't get contacted. And so we've started a real uh, hands-on effort this year to uh, connect with prospects more, find out more about them so that we can really make what we consider quality referrals to lodges. Um, so we know something about these people before we refer them to the lodge. Um, and then taking extra efforts to connect the lodge to the prospect and see that something comes out of that. And that the, and that the prospect, um, let's just call it file at the moment is resolved. Either this person is advancing toward becoming a member um, or we've decided he might be a better fit for a different lodge mm. or we've decided maybe masonry is just not the right thing for him and we can close that out. And so that's gonna make a big difference, I think. And of course the dues initiative that we started this year has been tremendous. It was a huge project, but um, sure. You know, 25,000 Masons have paid their dues online and, um, you know, more members are current with their dues than at this point last year. So lots of good news wow. coming out of that. And it just shows again that when we work together, um, we can really achieve good things. And I think the dues system we implemented this year is evidence of that. So a long and answer to your question, but there's a lot going on. Sure, sure. So, so right. can you tell us about like the process of launching a new project from like the inception of the idea all the way through to end user? And, and I'm purely speculating a technological hypothetical based on, on my personal perceptions of the pulse of masonry on a global scale. Like, what does that look like? Uh, uh, how do those meetings happen? Yeah, so they all start with goals, right? So we have certain outcomes are determined, for example, we want members to retain their membership, right? We want them, we want to make it easier for them to pay their dues. We want it, the, the lodge secretary's job to be easier, right? So we create these goals. And then from those goals, we're able to create kind of a roadmap of how we get there. Um, and, um, you know, so often today, technology is part of that solution. So we put together a pretty diverse team of people that are gonna design and implement the project, um, which would include people on our staff from uh, different departments, including member services, finance, IT, whatever, my communications almost always is part of the team. Um, and then we also include members. You know, we either work with formal committees or we put groups of members together to work with us. A lot of us are Masons um, and like myself attend Lodge very regularly. So we, you know, it's not like we don't know what's going on in our lodges, right. uh, but you can't have enough. Um, you know, it's a big organization and we cover a lot of area and what's true in Sacramento may not be true in Reading or San Francisco or Riverside or San Diego, right? Things can be different. And so we try to include a lot of members along the way, usually about a dozen for sure, um, end up being part of the process, if not more. And then you can just <laughs> imagine the project management that comes around. Right. Uh, we always, you know, create a launch date and work backwards. And um, it's, it's not different than what you probably do in your jobs every day, bringing new things about. It's a lot of communication, you know, and that's a big part of my job, mm -hmm. is being sure that everybody understands what the goals are, that everybody understands the direction that we're headed. Um, things don't always work out the way they're supposed to, and so being flexible 
and and nimble, being able to respond quickly when we realize things aren't working the way they're supposed to be working. Uh, sure. It's very helpful, and we've we've I think been able to do that. Do you see that process changing post COVID with reopening across the states? Is in do these idea presentations or these kind of like committee groups, does that happen over a dinner or is it at a grand lodge in, a, in an office setting? Yeah, it's interesting. Pre-COVID, we were sort of meeting focused, but you know, we launched a lot of big initiatives. I remember 2.0, the dues services, the restoration program, Amazing. all in the midst of COVID. Absolutely, so, um, yeah. A lot of the member engagement with that, um, uh, the new speaker series, uh, all these things had a lot of members involved and we're doing it all over Zoom. And mm -hmm. I think post COVID will continue to do that. It will allow us to involve more members in the process. Ah, Just make interesting, it more absolutely. More convenient for everybody. A absolutely. And so for those with, with those innovative ideas out there who are listening, what advice would you give them on how to best approach Grand Lodge with a venture to benefit the fraternity? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's just like anything else. Um, you can always send an email, right? And if yeah. it gets somebody's attention, right? Sure. And, and they have time to follow up on it, that's one way. Um, the other way is to develop a relationship with those people. Right. Like me, uh, you know, Jordan Yelnick, some of the Grand Lodge officers, uh, other key people you might meet at the retreats and so forth. Um, that's why I, that's one thing I do miss um, is the opportunity at these big events that we've done, typically that opportunity to sit around and talk. And that's where right. we get to share these ideas. And I've gotten a lot of ideas that way. And a lot nice. of programs are fun that way. Um, that's been a little different in the last year. Um, but, you know, we're going to return to in-person events, and that's a great time, yeah. I think. <laughs> Masters and Wardens retreats, Secretary Treasurer's retreats, the annual communication, other events. These are great times to get together and talk about what's going on and share mm -hmm. our ideas. Absolutely. And so, oops, sorry, my internet connection is a little bit slow right now, but uh, understanding that we have different people in mind for, for different situations as resources to make the best decisions possible. Who would you say you confide in the most? Who do I confide in the most? Hmm, that's a good question. Probably the Grand Master. Ah, um, excellent. Grand Master and I always have a very close relationship. Uh, ah. We talk very frequently. Um, and we have the kind of relationship where we can be very candid and honest with each other. Excellent. Um, it's not like we have a lot of secrets. Sure, sure. You know, there are things you, you wanna get straight in your own mind before you start talking to other people about them, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I would say more times than not, it's the grandmaster that I do that with. Wow, excellent. And so- The current grandmaster and I probably talk twice a day. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I was just going to ask like, what, what your current, you know, working relationship is with him. And I was assuming that, that you were, you know, right there on, on top, making sure like it's, it's X, Y, Z, you know. I've really had an advantage this last year, I'll be honest with you, because the Grandmaster hasn't had a really busy travel schedule. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he's been a little bit more available to me than the Grandmaster usually is. So, so very worshipful, uh, sidetracking, when you, when you travel with Grand Lodge or, or as a Grand Lodge representative and as you're going places, how do you guys travel? Do you, I know you don't just jump on economy seat, right? Like, how do, you, how do you do it? Yeah, you know, we try to make the travel dollars go as far as they can. So we're sure. actually pretty frugal um, ah. when we do that. So we, we rack up a lot of Southwest points. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So tell us about the level of commitment that it takes to, to, for you as a grand secretary, because I don't necessarily know if, if everybody kind of comprehends what exactly you're involved with and how much it really affects the movement yeah. of California masonry. So in our Grand Lodge, we expect the grand secretary to run the business of the organization. Um, and we have a pretty substantial organization 
not only do we have, you know, 45,000 members, 300 lodges, 260 properties around the state, but we have some big charities, the Masonic Homes, Acacia Creek, the foundation. We have that building in San Francisco, the garage operation. Um, we have different other properties around the state. Um, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions every year. Um, Absolutely. And there's a lot of risks um, and there are constant issues and problems and challenges to overcome. Uh, so we, we have a pretty, pretty good sized business for the Grand Secretary to be in charge of. We centralize <laughs> all of our business services. So the Grand Secretary provides all of the financial services, IT, human resources, legal, communications, uh, for all the entities, the Grand Lodge, the Homes, the Cache Creek Foundation, CMMT. The Grand Secretary acts as the chief executive for CMMT and the Knob Hill Masonic Center. Uh, so I have a very active role in the, in the city of San Francisco and in our neighborhood as a major landowner and uh, you know, the, the only major private assembly venue in the city. We're, we're a pretty active part of the city. So it's a big job. Uh, fortunately, because of the way we share services, I have a good staff and we mm. have enough people to get the right jobs done. Sure. Uh, yeah. but, but it's it's a big job uh, and it's 24 seven, right? <laughs> That's what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. You don't get to walk away. It's not nine to five. Right. Uh, uh, you know, during people say, how can you, how can you do masonry all day long and then go to lodge at night? Well, they're very different things. You know, <laughs> my, my day is not much different than some of yours. I mean, my day is spent with uh, financial folks, lawyers, insurance brokers, um, yeah. you know, all those types of things, solving issues. Right. So going to lodge at night is kind of a, a wonderful escape for me, <laughs> much like it is for all of you. Absolutely. And so so going back to the, the, the city of San Francisco and what we do with that, our partnership with San Francisco. Tell us about our public image from your perspective. Yeah, I would say, um, you mean in San Francisco? Which is Masonry, California. Yeah, in, in California, I think we're a good partner. You know, we've developed really good partnerships. Uh, we're a very good partner to several organizations in Cal in San Francisco and the city. Um, it's not uncommon for the city to call on us to participate in things. Uh, we're a major contributor at the Knob Hill Association, our neighborhood association. Um, you know, we really take care of the park and we we really support a lot of the work that's done in the park across the street. On a state level, we've got very good ties in public education. Um, the president of our foundation is often called upon uh, to be a part of what's happening um, in uh, education on the state level. We've got great partnerships with Major League Baseball. We work very hard to preserve those, um, particularly with the four clubs that we do uh, Masons for Mitts with. Um, and we build alliances, you know, our statewide partner, Raising a Reader. Um, we build alliances with them, with the State Department of Education, with the Major League Baseball Foundations. We're able to get them all working together. And I think, I think people view us as a convener, uh, too, of bringing people, bringing the right people together uh, to get things done. Our Grand Master and the Grand Lodge officers do a great job of doing public ceremonies throughout the state, you know, cornerstone ceremonies. We've really missed doing that in the last year, but we're going to get back at that, uh, supporting communities as they expand um, and so forth. So I think, um, well, let me just put it this way. I think when you see major statewide public events around literacy, recognizing teachers, you're going to see the Masons of California there. You may not see other organizations there, but you're, uh, going to see yeah, the, right. you're going to see the Masons of California there. That, that's beautiful. So, yeah. so what are you finding is the best way to, to promote our Masonic brand? Um, uh, you know, in addition to the partnerships that we have with, with municipalities and, and, and uh, 
I'm more it. convinced about this than ever before. Um, and it's actually pretty simple. Masonry is best marketed and best branded, best promoted to our family members and our friends and to Excellent. young people. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that we learned when we did the market research leading up to this current plan, so we did this market research last year, was number one, most everybody is motivated to explore masonry because of a family member or a friend. We get all these inquiries online, so we operated for a long time thinking, well, people are just finding us online. They're just searching Freemasonry and finding us. Well, what we actually found in the market research is, yeah, they're using the internet, but what motivated them was a relationship in their life. And it was either a family member or a friend or a colleague. And because of that relationship, then they went to the computer and searched to find out what was going on. Nearly every member we talked to uh, was able to point to a relationship with a family member or a friend, somebody they wanted to be like, somebody that they oh. wanted to connect with. And so you and I talking to our family and our friends and our colleagues about masonry is the best way to promote the organization. Um, and Absolutely. I think we're going to spend a lot of time um, uh, talking about that in the, in the you know, coming year. There's a lot of misconceptions among our members about what we can say to people. Sure. I think because of that, maybe because of our uneasiness and talking about ritual and some of the other sensitive things, some of us might avoid talking about masonry to our family, our friends and our colleagues. Um, and we wanna get over that. You know, we wanna right. get past that. And, and we want most of us to be comfortable talking because that's what's really gonna make a difference. Absolutely. And it's, it's one of those things I know that we, I highly encourage all our members to not necessarily cultivate but there's a lot of men who we know who we work with, just like you said, uh, you know, family members and, and associates that we work with at work and who are living a Masonic lifestyle already and just don't necessarily know it. So it's kind of growing that, that the misconceptions, if they have any, or at least introducing them to, to, the, to what masonry is. Um, and so what challenges have we found or have, are we facing with, with that? Uh, I'm going to answer that question in just a second, but I want to add... One of the other things that we learned is that most people learn about Freemasonry before they're 25 years old. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And so younger people are, are getting messages about Masonry from their family and friends in one way or another. And to, that was surprising to me because the average new member is 38 years old. But so that's... Young, that's reduced then. Yeah, by and large, they heard about this as a much younger person and didn't act on it until later in their life. Okay, so your, your question was, what is our biggest challenge in talking right. about masonry? I think um, understanding how relevant masonry is in the society today is really important. You and me and a lot of our brothers love the history of our organization. We love the connection to the past. We love some of the traditions that have been handed down. And those are all really important. Um, but to sustain ourselves, we also have to understand how we're relevant today. Right. And I don't think masonry has been any more relevant than it is right now. Right? 100% um, <laughs> agree. And so- agree. To me, we need to be focused on that, right? The world is struggling. Our communities are struggling right now to find harmony, to um, communicate with one another, to find and practice tolerance, to, um, you know, get in control of ourselves and behave in a way that is respectful sure. to other people. I mean, you're talking about all the things uh, that Masons have really focused on for hundreds of years. And so I think we have a lot to offer the world, right? What are the things that get in the way? Some of our past, 
issues like secrecy, issues around gender and religion, right? So we need to become more well-versed in all of those things and understand them better so that they're not stumbling blocks for us. They don't prevent our message from being heard um, and broadcast to a larger audience. Um, there will be probably always be detractors of masonry. Um, and we just need to be, I think, more skilled and more experienced in navigating that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you and I know there's nothing occult about masonry. Uh, we know that masonry exists for men and women. We just happen to be lodges made up of men. Um, we need to be, um, you know, open-minded to, to the fact that masonry can serve lots of people, even if our own lodge doesn't change or does things differently. Um, so that we take down some of those barriers that I think prevent us from talking clearly to others or confidently to others and, and kind of um, make way for the more important things I think we have to offer and talk about. Oh, yeah, that, that's definitely profound. Definitely. You know, even wow. so, so even on the concept of friendship, if I could for just a second, um, you know, we, we make really strong friendships in masonry. And mm -hmm. friendship is a declining commodity in the world. I was just reading an article and the title was, Why Are Men So Lonely? And it was this article about how loneliness is really becoming a huge um, negative impact in society, particularly among men. Um, well, here's an area where Freemasonry has expertise. I mean, right. we, know how exactly. to make, we know how to make connections and friends and strong bonds, support one another. So I'm just saying where well, there's so much relevance to what we do in today's society. Um, and that's our challenge, getting to that point where we talk about that, where people see that. Um, so that's the exciting challenge, I think. Very exciting, absolutely. And so uh, one of the last questions before, before we dive into the, to the infrastructure again. So with other affluent lodges geographically closer to Grand Lodge, and with those lodges historically being the farming grounds for Grand Lodge committee leaders, what does the selection process look like for brothers who are ready to work in those circles and are kind of thinking about affiliations for those uh, closer lodges near Grand Lodge? Mm -hmm. Well, your grand secretary came from a small town yeah. uh, and a small Masonic lodge. Um, and uh, I think that because they're... Um, there aren't, you know, there's only so many opportunities. I think a lot of people feel like their lodge or their areas is at a disadvantage, right? I still go to lodges that have never had a Grand Lodge officer from their lodge, oh. right? And guess what? Those lodges are in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego. Right. Um, so part of it is just understanding the scope of it all. Right. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. And, you know, there's 32 Grand Lodge officers and there's 330 lodges. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've had 11 Grand Secretaries in our entire history. Wow. Yeah. So there's probably. Uh, I should I should know this, but I'll guess there's probably only eight lodges that have ever had a grand secretary come from their lodge. Ah, uh, right. So that's just amazing. part of the you know wrapping your head around it. Right? Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. I've been a part of that process. I don't I don't appoint anybody to anything except the assistant grand secretary. Um, For sure. But I'm certainly part of the process, and I advise people on the process. And, uh, you know, ultimately it's the Grand Master, the current Deputy Grand Master that makes all of these decisions, but he is informed by a lot of people, including Assistant Grand Lecturers and Inspectors. 
we rely very heavily on those folks to make recommendations. Um, and oftentimes the grandmaster is making appointments based on those recommendations. He's sometimes doesn't know the people that he's appointing to a committee. He's making the appointment because the AGL recommended it or an inspector recommended uh, it. And he's, he relies on their recommendations. And oftentimes then those committee appointments are the sort of proving ground, right? So inspector recommends somebody for Masonic Properties Committee, you put that person on the committee and let's see what happens. How engaged are they? How much do they contribute? Uh, do they take initiative, right? Uh, and then, so then we have boards. So we've got 15 committees, right? And then we have five boards and these are people we need to be really engaged. So oftentimes they're looking at that committee makeup and saying, who are the people standing out in those committees? And are there some of those people to bring on to the boards? Uh, and sometimes the boards need industry experience. And again, we rely um, on the boards themselves. So the boards actually um, do recruitment also and make recommendations uh, to the grand to the deputy grandmaster really, who's will make these appointments for the following year. When it comes to the Grand Lodge officers, these are always people that the grandmaster knows. Something of these aren't close friends of the grandmaster. One or two of them might be, but they're people he has had exposure to. Exposure in right. committees, exposure on boards, exposure at masters and wardens retreats, or their inspectors. There's people that he's had an opportunity to build some relationship with, um, and I would say that's true for for about eleven of the thirty-two Grand Lodge officers. Uh, seven of us are elected, right? Um, so it's not up to the Grand Master necessarily. Um, and then we have nine AGLs, right, who serve as many as nine years. Um, and then there's the grand organist and the grand tiler, the assistant grand organist, the assistant grand tiler, which are these, you know, uh, jobs that have a lot of workload. And so people tend to stay in those positions for a while also. For sure. But when you boil it down to the Grand Master, you take out the elected officers, the AGLs, those other four, he really has 11 that he's appointing. They almost yeah. always try to do a geographic spread. They almost always look at, are there lodges that haven't had a Grand Lodge officer before? But they're, oh, also, they're also looking for compatibility. Sure, absolutely. Because they're absolutely. creating this team and they want that Definitely. team to have a certain dynamic or certain Absolutely. qualities, right? So for anybody who wants to be engaged, um, what I would say is, um, you know, do a good job in masonry, right? Show that you're, in, you're engaged, you're enthusiastic, you know how to manage your time, right? Um, and then talk to people, tell your inspector, tell the AGL, tell the grand secretary when you see him, hey, I'd like to do. <laughs> and, and maybe I'm a little bit biased only because I feel like I'm surrounded by some of the most extraordinary men in, in SAC 40. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're so talented. Like in my mind, I'm like, what the limitation, the limits of what you could do are endless. And so loving or being a, a lover of the fraternity it's like, how can I get these guys up there? Like, what can I do to, hey, hey, very worshipful, I need you to meet this guy. So that, that's where, where those questions kind of come from. Yeah, I think um, exactly what you said is the way to do it. You've got Jairo Gomez, who's in the meeting tonight. He's mm -hmm. a guy to talk to. Um, and just, you know, let people know that there's good people out there and, right. and, uh, and, and talk about it. There's no, um, you know, there's no click in all of this. Um, if you were to look at the Grand Lodge officers this year in a year, you'd see people who were very familiar to the Grand Master. Maybe they're from the same area, they have a history, 
uh, but you're also going to see people from all parts of the state, small lodges, big lodges, small towns, uh, big towns. So it, if it, I can see how it could be easily interpreted that way, um, but it really does come down. I mean, there's 44,000 Masons and he's going to sure. pick 11 of them to be yeah. Grand Lodge officers. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you put all the appointments together, inspectors and everything else, it's it's about two hundred and twenty-five appointments. Wow! Wow! Um, and so he he couldn't possibly just pick his friends, right, or pick the right. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And so and so since we're on that topic, uh, I know we kind of went off uh, just kind of talking. Um, but yeah, I love it. Yeah. Let's keep it. Up. <laughs> you ask the question. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for that. So, so, so with that, like what, what has been the most profound moment in your Masonic career? Um, what was kind of that aha moment for you in Masonry? Oh, I've had so many of them. <laughs> uh, I'll share one of them with you. Um, but like I said, I've had a lot, but this one, um, I haven't heard very many other people talk about. So, you know, we have the expl explanation of the lambskin apron. And I learned that when I was an entered apprentice Mason, just like everybody else. And I remembered thinking at the time, boy, they think pretty highly of this organization, right? It's I more, it's, it's, it's more of an honor than anything being king, prince, potentate. I was like, wow, that's a pretty lofty, that's <laughs> a pretty lofty claim. Right. And I love, um, I love the ritual and I love doing the ritual work. And I have delivered that lecture many times. I have coached candidates many, many times on that. And I always think about that. Wow, that is a pretty lofty claim. I was at a Masonic funeral uh, in 2010. Sitting in the back of the room, I wasn't involved. There was, a lot, there was hundreds of people there. It was a resident at the Masonic home who had died. And I was listening to the biography of the brother who died. And this was after they did the bit about the lambskin apron. So that was in my mind. And I had an aha moment. I figured it out, at least for myself. That ritual isn't saying that this is the highest honor that anyone can give to you. It's saying that being a Mason is the highest honor you can give to yourself. Beautiful. That's deep, worshipful. That is deep. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. And, and so in translation, the things we, we do for ourselves, the, the way we honor ourselves is more important and more valuable than any honor anybody can give to us. Wow. So right. we get those <laughs> awful moments. Well, thank you for dropping that uh, as our senior yes. warden calls it, like bits of gnosis. That that was amazing. Thank yeah. you for that, worshipful. So, yeah. Um, so, if you want to kind of explain a little bit about you know the the Grand Lodge structure and, and how that's formed, uh, I'll do see. that. I noticed that there's one question here from Brother Paul saying, "Do you have to be an exceptional ritualist to become a Grand Lodge officer?" Um, you, need, you need to be able to open and close Grand Lodge in a way that makes everybody proud. There's no question about that. Uh, but there's actually non-speaking roles uh, in there. So not everybody has to be a great ritualist in terms of somebody who memorizes a lot of work and speaks well. But you have to, you know, commit and learn the work and do it really well. And, um, you know, when we open Grand Lodge at at the end of communication, we want it to impress the brothers that are there. Amazing presentation, by the way, on that one. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so just tell me what you want to know. I'm enjoying the question and answer. So what is it? Oh, like, well, <laughs> what more do you want to know? Well, well excellent. Um, I guess certainly I was, uh, let me just kind of 
So I did write some notes down as far as, uh, okay, so going back to technology, um, what challenges are you finding as we continue to push into digitization of, of Grand Lodge? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, we're in an interesting space with technology right now where off the shelf products don't really do the trick, but, um, you know, developing things ourselves doesn't make sense anymore. Sure. Uh, and so it's, um, it's trying to find that space where we don't spend a lot of time and money developing things specific to us, but we work to make these products that don't quite fit, fit, right? Um, I, I remember 2.0 is a great example. Um, in some ways, the functionality in 2.0 is not as good as the functionality in 1.0, right? But 1.0, we built ourselves and maintained over 16 years. Wow. So you can imagine what that back room looked like. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. And all the problems and the cost and all of that. Well, today with 2.0, we're working with a product that 45 other Grand Lodges are also using, right? Great. Hundreds of thousands of members, thousands of lodges. Um, and so we're in this process of trying to make this product work because we want to be connected with our brothers all over the world. We want to start centralizing all of this, right? Uh, which means that, you know, we make compromises and we don't get everything we want when we want it sure. um, but we're working to be to be much more um, synchronized with a worldwide fraternity and not just looking at the Grand Lodge of California amazing but yeah things are just in an interesting space you know yeah. there, there's other issues like I really wish we had the lodge app that we used to have right Right. Facebook has killed all those companies. Nobody will build that. You know, right. I have members that volunteer and say, oh, I'll build it. But are they going to be able to maintain it for years? And, you know, all of those things. So it's a, it's a challenging time with technology because we're being driven to products like Facebook, these sort of one size fits all things. But they don't always fit. No, right, right. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, so with that, are there plans to kind of interconnect different grand lodges so that we can, you know, ch you know, chat with people? Because we have we have close connections with with members from New York. Matter of fact, one of the uh, one of our brothers here tonight has a uh, family member uh, that, that he wanted to kind of get in contact with. And so the other day when he mentioned, it, I said, "Well, our, our grand secretary is going to be on. Maybe that's something that we can kind of toss around the idea, and and as or or, or at least ask how to make that connection." And in that, with the technology side, it's like, how are we connecting all of us together outside of Facebook? You know, something that's on a, on a vetted platform that is for Masons, by Masons, and what does that look like? Yeah. So um, the most valuable Masonic experiences I've had have been abroad. I've learned so much about Masonry by traveling around the world, visiting lodges and, and meeting Masons. And so I'm a big advocate for that. Um, as a result, I have a pretty good understanding of what the worldwide fraternity is like. And for us Masons in California, we have a lot to offer the rest of the world and we have a lot to learn from them. Ah, ah that's so, a different perspective I didn't think about. Yes, it's a two-way street. Ah. That we, That's interesting. Um, I think we owe it to the fraternity. We owe it to other Masons to learn from what we're doing. And we owe it to ourselves to learn what they're doing because there's a lot, <laughs> of, a lot of the things we struggle with, other lodges have figured out already 200 years ago, <laughs> you know, and we <laughs> just need to, 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 you know, make those connections. And so I've worked pretty hard over the years to build bridges around the world and uh, very involved at the national and international level 
with that goal in mind. Um, I was president of the Conference of Grand Secretaries of North America last year. And that was a three year sort of leadership cycle. And um, we worked on a project to um, link all the, link membership databases all around the world. And so far we have achieved it uh, in, the, in the US, we're getting very close. Right, right. Uh, where we essentially have three systems in the US. And those three systems are going to be able to integrate fairly soon. Um, so, and so, with the integration, what what does it integrate? Does it just it's connecting from lodge to lodge? I'm assuming, possibly a member search. Definitely. And so, right now, if you want to affiliate with a lodge in Massachusetts, there's all this correspondence that has to go on between our grand lodges. We're very near to the point where that's the people in Massachusetts will just look up your record. They'll just, they'll, they'll have your record or have access to your record and just add to it, add your affiliation. You know, they'll be able to see where you're at. Um, and that's, yeah. Yeah, we've been working with a company called Copiri, which is owned and run by Masons that do other software, but they're doing software with us too. You've probably seen Amity. Oh, we definitely know Amity. Amity yeah. So we're using- we're I had working, a meeting with them a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Yeah. We're working with Amity to be a part of this solution because there's a lot of Grand Lodges in South America, Central America, that don't really have databases. Um, and they're not that interested but they could use an app like Amity to substitute for that. Well, I think it's important then to have that as part of the integration. Um, right. There's gonna be Grand Lodges that go for that full scale membership application like the one we're using. Um, and there's some that just want names and email addresses. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, their date, you know, their initiated pass and raise dates, right? right. And, you know, Amity's really had a lot of reach around the world. Um, so we're working, the, the conference just uh, finalized an agreement with them uh, to build uh, this integration that we're working on so that all these systems can come into the same data, can use the same data. So um, that's gonna help a lot. Uh, right. But particularly on the business side, you know, the communication side between lodges, we just, um, it's really an effort to educate folks and get Masons out there visiting, which I think Amity does a great job of. You know, their whole thing started out as travel safely. They'll help you, you know, go right. to Argentina and figure out which lodges you can visit there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, that's Absolutely. Kind of really important. I would love to continue that topic of conversation, certainly at a different time. That's what kind of what I was asking earlier. I was like, well, what's that process look like? Is it, is it a dinner? Is it a meeting? Um, so yeah, you know what definitely... I would recommend for anybody in California mm -hmm. is just go across the border into Tijuana and visit a lodge. It'll blow your mind. You'll, you'll be talking about it for months. Sounds it's, good. It's a completely different system. Wow. And there are some things about it where you'll go, hmm, they should come look at what we do. But there's other things that you'll go, wow, that's really a great idea. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Now, do, do you think that that, for instance, just for the, that Tijuana Lodge, do they have similarities to our, our I think there's two Spanish speaking lodges in California. Do some of those cultural similarities overlap? Some, but they have more connection and more similarities with our French speaking lodges. Ah. So when you think about masonry around the world, there's really two strands. There's like English masonry and French masonry. And as the English and French, you know, explored the world, they took masonry with them. Hmm. And so you see lodges that have an English influence or a French influence. And most all of the, Mex the lodges in Mexico have a French influence. They use the French rituals, the Scottish Rite rituals, oh, and a lot of those oh, customs. 
So that's why I say it'll seem like a completely different experience to you while similar, uh, different, and you'll, you'll get an interesting exposure to a different brand of masonry or stream of masonry. But you'll never oh. find, you'll never find more welcoming people. Oh, wow. Welcome. I certainly, I certainly can't wait that. Yeah. I did, that wasn't necessarily on the bucket list. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to now trying that. So SAC 40, uh, let's get your, get your passport for going to Mexico this summer. <laughs> and then, uh, but one of the other ones is the Grand Lodge of Philippines. And that's certainly uh, another, you know, place I would like to go uh, visit masonry. And so, um, yeah, I was able to visit them in, in 2016. It was great. Really oh, wow. They've had a couple new um, YouTube videos for, for their Shriners. Like uh, there's a three, four part series, really interesting stuff out there. And just yeah. the, the depth and commitment of masonry certainly shows. <laughs> and so, yeah, we have a, a lodge here in Sacramento, General Douglas MacArthur Lodge. Like the, when those boys walk in the building, you know who those guys are. So, I mean, That's right. love those guys. Yeah. So and it's a really it's a point of pride for our Grand Lodge. I mean, we're the mother Grand Lodge of the Grand Lodge of the Philippines. We, we created that Grand Lodge. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So it's awesome. Uh, excellent. Next, the next issue of the Freemason magazine is going to deal with that relationship directly. Oh, interesting. Wow. I look forward to reading that. Yeah. That's going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. And, um, so, and I'm not sure, I, I, we tried to connect yesterday, uh, very worshipful as far as like, well, how much time do you have tonight? Uh, I've got time. I, you know, okay. I, I can talk more about Grand Lodge officers if you want me to, but I've, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed oh. the question and the answer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you did. I was like, you know, I'm just going to kind of see where it goes and yeah. it just kind of flew in, you know, so, um, so let's check the questions in the chats. Do we have anything in there? Uh, is there a way a lodge could enhance, for example, a first degree or second degree work to make it unique to a particular lodge? Is that possible? If so, how would it be done? One of the things I love um, in my own lodges are the traditions that we build around degrees. Um, and it can sometimes be the... Um, sort of like gifts or tokens that we give uh, to members um, that make the ritual more special and more meaningful to them. Um, sort of with the big membership booms in the 20th century, all of that stuff became so depersonalized. The apron, the trowel, um, the Bible, Right, right. Uh, to the point that, I don't know, they just don't have the same value that they might have. And so what I would say is think about those things that you give to a member in order for him to remember the degree and make them special, make them unique to your lodge. They're going to cost more money because they're not coming from some mass produced factory, but just charge a little bit more in your degree fees and give them handmade, custom made things that really drive home the message of the degree. Make sure he receives an apron that if somebody in his family comes across it, they will know that it's something really important ah, and not just something okay. that can be tossed out. Okay. Right. Um, so I would say start there. I think the brother's question really is around doing things in the ritual, right? And, you know, in California, we have one ritual, which is different. You know, many Grand Lodges have several rituals. The United Grand Lodge of England, you've got dozens to choose from. Oh, wow. Uh, Grand Lodge of New York, I think the last time they told me they had 28 different rituals that lodges could choose from, right? Uh, but that's not the case in California. We have essentially one ritual. Um, and so, um, you know, we try, therefore, to give everybody a pretty consistent experience. Um, 
we've done uh, some things recently that I think have been good, right? We've um, made it clear that lodges can do chambers of reflection, which is a way to personalize the degree. We've said that two people can deliver the lectures, which can sometimes make um, a big difference in the experience. Sure. Not only is it a little easier for the people because they don't have to deliver so much of it, but it's sometimes <laughs> better for the person listening to get a different voice. It, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, beyond that. Um, but I would say focus on the traditions in and around the degrees <laughs> that make them really special and unique. We only it's receive right. these degrees once in our lifetime. And sure how we celebrate that and how we make sure that evening is a memorable experience, not just a degree, I think is more important than any little thing we could do in the ritual. Right, absolutely. And, and we certainly have, have done some of those things. Uh, uh, we, we've, we've been able to manipulate the lights inside of our temple to kind of give it different, uh, different feels. We've implemented uh -huh. music with our, with our organist. Uh, we, the chamber of reflection um, and really trying to, just like you said, capture those moments and make them special and certainly memorable for, for, for those candidates and, and, and those brothers. So uh, let's see what else do we have? Somebody mentioned custom embroidered blindfolds and cable toes and they put LOL, LOL. invest in your paraphernalia, make it, make it nice you know when you hand the trowel to the master mason in the third degree let it be impressive let it be something that he goes oh what is this it's a certain weight and it's something it feels like i've just been given something really important oh, interesting yeah absolutely rather than something that feels like aluminum <laughs> you know, right. think, think those things through because they, they may not mean as much to you and I who do this all the time, but to the person who's experiencing it for the first time, those things actually make a big difference. Brother Secretary, you got that? Check. Thanks. And we actually, yeah. we just raised, increased our, uh, or we're in the process of increasing our, our uh, petition fees so we could implement more of these uh, uh, things and really kind of give that experience to the entire thing. And, and you know, we, we're letting our prospects know, like, it costs a little bit of money in order to, to, to receive some of these things that they come along with, mm -hmm. with the, the knowledge that we can all share with, amongst each other. Um, yeah, and build the culture in your lodge. I mean, I was, um, I know you're recording this, and I haven't even told my lodge yet, but um, I was, uh, I was in Delaware last year, and I happened to be in an, in an antique store and I came across a trowel from the early 20th century and it is gorgeous. It's got wow. a bone handle. It probably weighs five pounds, right? Nice. And um, I'm having it uh, engraved for my lodge. And, and that's the trowel we're gonna use in, in the degree. So, you know, that's you awesome. can do things as they go along. So we have a Wyoming, the Wyoming question. So he has a great uncle and possibly a grandfather, both have passed, that were Masons in Wyoming, and he would like to find their lodges. What is the best way for him to contact and find out? So write to us at member services at freemason.org. Member services, it's plural, at freemason.org. Give us his name, everything you know about him. If you have his, well, I guess there's more than one, but give us their birthdays. Um, anything you know, what towns they lived in, anything that will help, we'll contact that Grand Lodge and try to get the information and we'll get it to you. And if I may add, the, the member services program that, that we've kind of started just, just now really relying on and using as a tool and a resource for ourselves has been so amazing. Um, I believe his name is Jonathan down there. Jonathan uh, Prestige. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like anytime we need something, he's, he's on it. Paul asks some random questions all the time. And, and Paul comes back. Uh, he, Paul's our junior warden. And, and he's like, I just talked to member services. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, I'm so happy that we have that, 
that resource for us to, to use. And it's, it's something I'm, so I'm from, from, uh, oh my goodness, Mount Vernon, Virginia. I was raised out, out East. I don't remember the, the Grand Lodge kind of being this like open to be like, Hey, I want you to be successful. Here's all the resources you have in order to be successful. Um, you know, and that was 15 years ago. So I'm sure technology has changed, but it's so refreshing to be like, we have got, we have a corporate office. We can just reach out to and find this information. Uh, so they're a great you. team. They're a great team. And, yeah. and we use, you wouldn't be surprised, I think, to hear that we use Salesforce to track all these requests. So you make oh, wow. okay. of them. it goes into a Salesforce queue um, and we have goals around response time, completion time. Mm. The team is just really great. I mean, essentially yeah. there's three of them and they get between two and 300 requests a week and 90% of them they complete in the same day they receive it. I mean, they're just fantastic. And they really care, you know. Mm. Absolutely. And so, so how many members or, or how many on that team, are, are they all Master Masons or, or Masons or? No, no. Um, we have people that work for us that are not Masons. Um, and we have, you know, a fair number that are. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, so with, with working with like other Grand Lodges, like who do you closely work with the most? Or, or is there any kind of like other Grand Lodges who are, who you're collaborating with on, on future projects or uh, like who, who is our, who's our sister Grand Lodge? Well, that's a good question. Um, so like I said, I, I maintain pretty strong relationships with Grand Lodges around the world. Um, you know, and wishful, I, I trust me, I, I talk to some of these guys too and they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty engaged with the Grand Lodges in Mexico. I've, um, you know, we've had a goal to really build strong relationships with the state Grand Lodges. There's 32 of them uh, in Mexico. So I spend a lot of time there. Baja California, you know, right across the border is probably our closest relationship there. Baja California Sur, just south of Baja California. Um, you know, those guys I consider very close friends and you know, we do a lot together. Um, the Grand Lodge of Washington, uh, the Grand Lodge of Kansas, uh, Massachusetts, uh, District of Columbia. Uh, these are Grand Lodges that we just seem to have a lot in common in terms of our approach to things. So we tend to work together a lot. I've got, you know, good relationships with England and France and, um, Serbia, believe it or not, the, the wow. leadership there and I have developed really good relations and rely upon each other uh, for information, for ideas, somebody wow. to complain to, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we have a lot of tentacles around uh, around the world. And that's, that's so, it's, it's great to hear that only because I'm like, oh my God, we have, in my opinion, I think we have a, a wonderful uh, perspective and approach to Freemasonry. And I'm like, I, I already know that it's getting out there because of, because of, you know, your service and, and, and your team around there. So it's great to hear it. Uh, we can all assume like, Worshipful Castle is out everywhere. Like this guy, like he is, he's doing things, you know, and we're, we're proud of that. So I just wanted to kind of hear where, where we're at with that. So um, yeah, and I, I do travel some, but I also, a lot of this, lot I'm, of this I'm just doing through email and phone calls. And, yeah. So then that's obviously has changed as far as for, with this year being more. And th this year for us has been, the silver lining has been that we've been able to to connect more with, with other lodges um, and then really kind of like with our small little piece of the Masonic circle here in California, been able to establish you know, connections and contacts and friendships with, with other lodges. And we do, we share, you know, education nights and uh, it's, it's been an amazing, uh, oh, I don't want to say amazing time because of, you know, everything else, but like just, it just kind of worked out for Mason, for Masonry in Sacramento, in my opinion. Uh, so that's been exciting. You've got to, you've got to make these situations work for you. you can't right, right. You got a carpe diem, worshipful, that's it. That's right. That's right.
So I see some questions there about how is the lodge different from Grand Lodge or how are they similar? Um, and uh, I see this last question about, you know, do we have stated meetings or degrees? So one of the big differences between a lodge and the Grand Lodge is the Grand Lodge doesn't confer degrees. Lodges are the only ones that make masons. Um, so the Grand Lodge doesn't do that at all. The Grand Lodge does uh, do ritual because we open and close Grand Lodge uh, to do certain ceremonies, cornerstone ceremonies, sometimes constitution ceremonies or dedication ceremonies. Um, so we do do ritual, but we do not confer degrees. Um, so that's a big difference. Um, the business of the Grand Lodge then, you know, we have our annual business meeting where essentially the masters and wardens make all the decisions, changes to our rules, affirmation of our rules, adopting the budget, electing the officers, right? Um, in between the annual communication is the Grand Master and the Executive Committee, which technically is the Deputy Grand Master, Senior and Junior Grand Warden. And they invite the Grand Treasurer, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Lecturer, and then AGLs also attend that meeting. Uh, maybe not everyone, but they do come periodically. And that's where the business is done. And we have a monthly meeting. So it's kind of like a stated meeting, but it's more structured like a board meeting. And that's where those business decisions are made. And is that happening still now, kind of just online or, or virtual, just as we are? Yeah. yeah, ever since March of last year, we've been doing them on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the reception? So, because it, it all kind of happened so quickly. And for, for us, it was like, there was about two weeks, three weeks where like, uh, I don't, like we, we just so happened to jump on Zoom. I think we were closed like on a Tuesday and we kind of put things together to be like, let's jump online just to kind of figure things out. And it kind of just stayed with us. But there was a lot of, you know, a lot of the brothers and members who were like, ah, I don't want to do that soon stuff. Like, did you guys get any pushback like that from Grand Lodge officers? No, mm -mm. no, I think everybody realized that this was the hand we were dealt. Sure. And we have to keep things going. And right. this is the only way we do it. Mm -hmm. you know? it, so. it certainly has yielded some some it, wonderful, pro, like the, the guest speaking series, we, we've hopped on that so many times as far as, because it just so happens to land on Wednesdays, which I'm like, yes, because sometimes it's like, uh, you know, because I'm always looking at the calendar, and I'm like, every Wednesday, every Wednesday, what do we got? What do we got? Education night, and it's easy to kind of like piggyback off of that, open our own Zoom room, uh, Zoom room and kind of talk about the discussion as we go or whatever the cases are, so. This, this coming weekend is a good example. So we've been doing the yes. International Conference on Freemasonry for years at UCLA, right? So how is this conference different than other things we do? This is an academic conference, really. The speakers are professors at universities all around the world who make their living studying and writing about masonry, right? Uh, so it's been an important thing. And we've had, you know, 200, 250 people at this conference every year, which for an academic conference, believe it or not, is a lot of people. And, and that's what most of these professors tell me is they love our conference because most academic conferences are just the other speakers. You know, it's like, oh, wow. right? So <laughs> we bring this big audience that asks lots of questions. Well, we have over a thousand people registered for Saturday. I'm certainly looking forward to it. I know uh, there's been a continuous push uh, with us as well to make sure that everybody's registered and going on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's going to be amazing. I just got another, uh, let's see. Okay. So yeah, other than, let's see. So what, what else, is there anything else for like, as far as Grand Lodge? So um, I guess going off of that, how do a lodge like us, in addition to tonight and kind of like extending the olive branch and saying like, we're here in case you need anything, like we got you. How do we position ourselves to become a first call resource to Grand Lodge? In the sense that um, if there's programs that need to be tested or, or initiatives or something, um, 
because a lot of our members are really, they want to contribute to a bigger cause, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, and again, it's just, how do, how do we, how do we get the boys there? Yeah, I would say continue doing what you're doing. Um, invite people into your lodge. Let them see, you know, invite people to continue to come to your lodge and speak, right? Uh, when we can do this again, visit other lodges. Yeah. Uh, participate fully in things like the Masters and Wardens retreats and engage with other people. You know, sometimes lodge leaders will go to those retreats and they stick together the whole weekend. Right, and right. You might, have, you might have a good time and, and have a chance to talk through lodge issues together, uh, but also make time to meet other people and right. develop yeah. those relationships. You know, yeah. use social media, invite people to your, do good programming and invite people to it. Definitely. All right. You're definitely on any... my radar. Oh, well, thank you. We appreciate that. Do we have any questions from uh, any of the brothers out here? Any additional ones? Let's see. What else do we have on here? Yeah, Wishful, I, I have a question. It's Paul. Uh, um, where was for Tesla? How, if, if you were incoming... Worshipful Master, how would you make your tenure uh, and make um, the installation a memorable one for your offices? Well, what what things would you recommend um, an incoming Worshipful Master can do to make that event a special event, like so that um, once he's once he's gone, they'd remember him and they'd remember that installation. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I have a few few things I would recommend. Um, and these are in no particular order, but sort of as they come to mind. One, really give some thought to your message. You have a chance as the newly installed master to deliver a message. You're gonna have plenty of time to talk to people about the calendar and about activities that your lodge is gonna do. So you don't need to do that in that message. You, in that message, you want to connect with people. You want to share a vision for masonry in your lodge that will inspire people. You don't want it to be long. You don't want a long speech. You want impactful speech. You want people to feel good about masonry and where the lodge is going. So give some thought to that because you have the opportunity, you've got the bully pulpit, so to speak. You've got an opportunity. Um, you know, thanking people and all of that is important. Find a way to do that in a really concise but appropriate way and then really focus on a message with a vision. So that's one thing. The second thing is to honor your junior officers. As master, this is a big moment for you. And everyone is gonna celebrate that. You don't need to celebrate it. You can celebrate the officer that's being installed for the first time, whose family might be there. Think about those brothers and that experience. Um, so that's the second thing. The third thing I would say is create at least one moment in the installation that's really memorable. And it can be anything. Um, at, for the Grand Lodge, we create that moment when the Grand Master takes his obligation the lights go down, this blue light comes on. Sometimes there's a musical presentation when he's at the altar. Um, and we make this like a very solemn, and it's the thing everybody takes a picture of at the annual communication. It's the thing everybody remembers. It doesn't have to be that, but find a moment, right? And really plan it out. Have live music or have a live performance 
maybe it's something special. It's not somebody playing the piano. Maybe it's somebody playing the harp, but something that's going to be special and memorable, right? The whole event doesn't have to be this way. Just find one moment that is, that is special. Okay. And then the last thing I would say is make sure the food is good. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> You'll be a good you. every time. Nice. All right, Paulie, I know you got more questions down there. No, that, that was that was it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have anything else for uh, any questions or anything like that? Right now is the time to ask, as in very wishful, I'm assuming is, is, as we all know, super busy. And uh, if there's any questions about Grand Lodge or, uh, yeah. Oh, I have a question about Grand Lodge. So uh, very wishful. Uh, so how many offices are there? And uh, is it the same similar makeup to a, a regular Blue Lodge? And how many of those officers, I think you I may, may have mentioned it before, how many officers need to qualify like for, for a speaking part? Uh, I am going to just, um, if you let me share my screen, I'll show a quick PowerPoint and I'll, I'll run through it cool. quickly. Thank you. Right now it says the host Oh, okay. Lake's probably work. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. I'm just going to show you this real quick. Um, this is a basic presentation on the Grand Lodge officers. Um, so there's what we call the progressive line. These are four of the elected officers. And we call it the progressive line because it's assumed that the junior grand warden will become the senior grand warden, will become the deputy grand master, will become the grand master, right? Um, and so what's different is, is the grand lodge has a deputy grand master and lodges do not. Um, then there are the non-progressive elected officers, the grand treasurer, the grand secretary, the grand lecturer. These are the folks that we um, entrust some really important responsibilities with um, you see some numbers by them. We've only had 25 grand treasurers in our history. We've had 11 uh, grand secretaries. The grand secretary can appoint an assistant grand secretary and there's only been 21 of those. The grand lecturer position is what's different. A lodge doesn't have this. We created the position in 1900. So we went 50 years without a grand lecturer um, and there's been 19 of them ever since. We have then assistant grand lecturers um, that lodges don't have, like Brother Hiro, who's here tonight. And their job is to assist the grand lecturer um, in a specific region of the state. Um, we've got a grand chaplain and a grand order and a grand marshal. The chaplain does what you would expect. The grand marshal is really the grand master's sort of right-hand person like his adjutant, if you're familiar with that phrase. Um, he is the one that communicates to the rest of the Grand Lodge officers. He generally travels with the Grand Master and helps him, um, you know, be on time and know where he's going and sometimes carrying his bag, if you will. Um, so the Grand Marshal is very different than a Lodge Marshal. Even though the Grand Marshal does things like proclamations and carries a baton, he's got a big job uh, in supporting. Uh, he's like the, the executive assistant, if you will, to the Grand Master. And then we have a Grand Orator at the Grand Lodge, which is different uh, than a Lodge. And the Grand Orator's job is to give public addresses. So whenever we do a public event, like a cornerstone at a school, the Grand Orator gives a speech on behalf of masonry. Then we have bearers. We have a Bible bearer, a standard bearer, and a sword bearer. These are officers that carry in certain paraphernalia that lodges don't have. 
Uh, we've got senior and junior grand deacons and stewards just like lodges, and they do very similar things. The stewards definitely are the, um, they manage all the social time for the grand lodge officers. So they plan, you know, um, informal get togethers. Like if we all travel to Southern California for the weekend, the stewards will put together a hospitality suite where people can gather in between events or whatever. We also have a grand pursuivant, which lodges do not have. And the grand pursuivant's job is to announce and introduce visitors from other grand lodges. And I told you about the organist and the tiler and lodges have those as well. So that's a quick answer to that question. It's a great insight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that, that we've been talking about like, well, what, what is, what's going, you know, how do they do it? I was, I was honored to, uh, for the opportunity to participate in the selection committee of the junior grand award. And so, and as, as a most forceful, uh, you know, kind of recommended and encouraged, you know, we, we talked about the process of how that worked and, uh, because before then I had no idea. I was just like, well, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's who, you know, guys, <laughs> I don't know. So it was interesting. And I was so, so honored to, to be a part of it. And uh, that was a cool experience. Yeah. I think what's, what's really important, and I'm sure you've shared it with your lodge brothers is that we have a system where brothers are called to service. And that's, so important. I've learned over the years, looking at other Grand Lodges who don't necessarily do it that way, um, how important that is. The people we select are not generally people that would have run in a competitive race and tried to beat other people in right. a race. Yeah. These are people who receive a phone call and are blown away <laughs> that they get this phone call and they say, why me, right? Uh, and they, they realize they have to step up and they have to be their best self because their brothers have called them to service. That's very different than running, believing you already deserve it, believing you're the best person for the job and beating other people in a race. It's just a completely different experience and creates a completely different leader and I think we're blessed with that system. Yeah. And it's, a, it's certainly a beautiful one. Um, one of the things that, that I haven't really mentioned throughout the, that I try to mention indirectly by, by encouraging people is, is to like be that servant leader, right. be that guy that's like, I don't need the credit. I don't, titles are titles. Like, I just want to make sure that we keep moving forward and I'm doing this because I love the we're doing this because we love our bros, right? We, we want we want to make sure that we're positioning ourselves because you know, I, I love my guys. Like I'm so yeah. proud of SAC 40. It's like to have you on tonight, I was like. Yes. And it's the same thing. Your brothers have called you to leadership, right? You didn't run against six people to be master of your lodge. Right. Um, we don't have the formal system in our lodges, but we do have the same system. It's kind of informal the right person rises up. Everybody right. accepts the fact that this is the right person. You know, sometimes there might be a few people that disagree, but more just like in the meeting you were in, there can be a few people that disagree, but a vast majority, a super majority of the people believe that this is the right person. Right, right. And that's just critical, I think, to the culture in our lodges and our grand lodge. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well. Uh, you know, Worshipful, I have uh, one other uh, off, off the cuff question, yeah. if we have time. Uh, and thank you, brother, for all of this wonderful information. I was wondering if uh, the, the world of cornerstone ceremonies has always interested me. Um, I always enjoy seeing the cornerstone at our Capitol when I go in and out for work uh, and help put together the cornerstone for the uh, King Stadium. King State, yeah, the Kings Arena. That's where what that was Tristan that's right there. Excellent. <laughs> you know, Grand Lodge once once sat. And, um, you know, I was just wondering how, 
is there any trend or, or any development on how, how those have been received or, or even like how I'd be interested to know if we even know how it came about and why we even do it. Um, it's, it just seems interesting. I've been in other County buildings and whatnot. And all of a sudden I, I turn the corner and there it is a square and compass. And, uh, it's just a fun little thing we do. And I, I just wonder if we know why, and, uh, if it's still keeping up with, uh, the modern cycles, um, uh, I, I have another one in my head to do when the Capitol undergoes some renovation and they're going to build an entire new annex. I think it'd be kind of fun to do another sitting there, a setting uh, for that new building. But just wondering, you know, what's the world of Cornerstones like these days? Yeah, and to touch on the history, uh, you know, the, the ceremony was written in the late 18th century when George Washington laid the cornerstone for the Capitol of the United States. And so, so that is the recorded beginning. There is some belief that some kind of ceremony had been done previously, but that was the first one that a ceremony was written for. And we use that same ceremony today. So it is a uniquely American um, endeavor, which has spread to other parts of the world, not very many funny enough, but if you go to Canada, for example, you'll see cornerstones, but you won't see them in other parts of the world. Um, and so we think it's really important to celebrate the development of our communities. And when public buildings are built, we want to bring the community together to celebrate it. What other thing is being done to do that, right? So we're often the only game in town when it comes to having a ceremony to celebrate the creation of a new civic building. And that's the way we see it. If we're building a new school or a new stadium, what we really want it to be is a marker of an important time in the development of a community. And so we want to continue to do that. We look for opportunities. Um, and try to take advantage of them. We rely on, on you guys. We rely on our lodges to say, there's a new school being built. There's a library being built. We're building a new sheriff's department and uh, working with your inspector and others and the AGL to put that together. Our grandmaster will do as many cornerstone ceremonies as he can possibly do because they're important. Um, you know, uh, we've got to put a good face forward for the fraternity because people do ask questions. I mean, right there in your neighborhood, I had a pretty uh, tough conversation with an assistant superintendent of the Elk Grove School District who wanted to know why there was a separate organization for Black Masons, right? We've got to be able to explain these things. Mm -hmm. she, she was an African-American woman herself, and she, she wasn't sure she wanted to work with an organization that had segregation wow. you know, along racial lines. She wanted to know why women weren't allowed to be Masons, right? And so we had to address those things with her. And ultimately, we were able to do a cornerstone ceremony there. But, you know, again, we've got to be um, at, our, you know, at our best. Uh, when we're dealing with public officials these days about making sure they want to associate with masonry and that they have the information that they need. Absolutely. And so, so just out of curiosity, how did you de-escalate and then re-educate to move that project forward? Well, in that particular case, I recommended that she talk to a Prince Hall Mason about nice. why Prince Hall Masonry was so important. Good call. Um, and so I connected her with a Prince Hall Mason in, in the area. And I think that helped, but it wasn't a silver bullet. Sure. As Cairo knows, it took us about a year and a half, maybe even two years to actually get that cornerstone done because she, two years, wow. after, she <laughs> was um, concerned, you know, she was concerned. So, wow. Interesting, absolutely, and it's and it's it is interesting because because that the, the information wasn't necessarily there on, on on her side, 
knowing that last year, you know, we, one of my biggest agendas was to try to merge, not merge, but bring the Prince Hall, just establish a relationship. That was my entire goal. After talking to him, we, we all kind of hung out. We've, we've, uh, visited each other's lodges. Now, now we have a Prince Hall Lodge inside of, of the Sacramento downtown, you know, building. And I'm like, that's amazing. That's awesome. I, I, I love, matter of fact, I was texting their senior warden the, the other day, just randomly talking to, you know, just hanging out or, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting how much people don't know what they think they know. Uh, and that's what we're here to kind of like. And it's really important that we get out in front of it because mm -hmm. it's easy for people not to understand. Right. I didn't know what Prince Hall Masonry was as a Mason until I went to the annual communication as the junior warden of my lodge. Ah. And at the annual communication, I saw people being introduced from the Prince Hall Grand Lodge. I didn't know what it was. And I asked and they told me and I was appalled. I was like, what do you mean there's a separate organization? Right. Um, and it, it, it was only until I took time and got to know Prince Hall Masons and the story of Prince Hall and gained an appreciation of how important Prince Hall is as a figure in Masonic history. And that the preservation of his name and his legacy is so really right. important. But Absolutely. That is not apparent to people just on the outset, right? Right. And so we can't assume that people are just going to understand. I actually I think we can assume they're going to misunderstand. Correct. So we have to be um, ahead of that and we have to be really genuine in our uh, efforts to work um, in unity with Prince Hall Masons and other Masons. Right, right. Ah, uh, I have a question, uh, Worshipful. Um, this is uh, the senior warden, Joseph Long. Um, I, uh, the story you just told about the uh, superintendent in uh, Elk Grove, I was just curious. Uh, that's an interesting story. Um, and uh, when you, were you kind of caught off guard or broadsided when you, uh, uh, when you and Hiro had to approach her? Uh, you know, with, you know, having to defend seemingly an organization that we all love, but has a, you know, a past that it is, you know, shaded by uh, controversy. Yeah, I cool? will remember that moment when she, she, I was sitting across the table from her when she asked that question. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I will remember that moment for the rest of my life because I felt like I didn't know how to respond at first. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I thought she asked a very good question. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm glad that she had uh, the backbone or, you know, she felt confident enough in her mm -hmm. own position to ask the question mm -hmm. and to ask it, you know, she wasn't defensive or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was pretty matter of fact. Mm -hmm. and, and I did feel like I was caught off guard and like I should have that should have been at the tip of my tongue. I should be more um, conversant in these issues mm -hmm. and not feel like I have to go home and think about this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've made a commitment since then to be somebody who's well-versed in these issues. Um, not only because the position I'm in the member, our members deserve to have a grand secretary that's well versed in these issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as a Mason who cares, right? Eternity, I feel like I need to be well versed in these issues. The the, the other, I wanted to follow up just one last time, when uh, or one last thing, uh, when you asked her to speak with, or when you suggested and had her reach out or had a Prince Hall Mason, when you put those two in contact with one another. Did you get any follow-up blowback from that? Or did you get feel like she was, for example, um, I don't know, maybe trying to, you were trying to win her over by showing, hey, we have black masons and you're black and that kind of, I'm not trying to, I'm not sure um, how to uh, characterize that. If I that. remember right, I think she knew the person. Uh, oh, okay. If I remember, if I'm remembering this right, I, I think she knew the person 
Um, I think to your question, she never gave me direct feedback. I know that they talked mm -hmm. and I got the impression, she didn't tell me this, but I got the impression it partially answered her question. Got it. Uh, I, mean, I don't think she felt like it fully answered her question. Yeah, that's uh, that's that that's impressive. I mean, I you, you can't anticipate. That's a you, you. Most people don't know even. Uh, I well couldn't anticipate people. walking into that. Right? Yeah, and and folks yeah. don't know whether we take women, don't take women, all these things, and just to be just to, and we're so used to people not knowing much about us, and then. When you're sitting down and it's that you at you're asked this very pointed and direct question. <laughs> it just yeah. Well done. Yeah, definitely. And th thank you for, for representing us on that, Marshfall. And I'm sure that there are so many different examples and in where you little bits of the day you're like, man, like I am so I answered that so nicely. Not not to not to pat yourself on the back, but because of the responsibility that you have for California masonry and like for us to sit back here on a Wednesday night and be like, I know that tomorrow morning when worshipful Castle gets in the office, we're good. We're absolutely good. So we thank you. And um, certainly thank you for, for, for coming on tonight. And before we end tonight's presentation, uh, I want to take a quick moment to recognize a few special people who we've been, who's, who have been instrumental in the continued success of, of Sacramento Masonic Lodge number 40. Um, beginning with our, our district inspector, Worshfa Wu, who's, who's not on here, but uh, he's encouraged us to push the boundaries of, of our social media campaign and take our brand online. And uh, that support has inspired us to continue moving. So I wanted to thank him and hopefully, he, as this will be recorded, I hope he hears it in the future. Um, and then Worshful Jairo Gomez, who has always goes out of his way to put things into perspective for us and inspires ideas in, in our own pursuits of knowledge. Um, Worshful, I thank you for... for thinking of us and, and for always having the willingness to talk to us about masonry at, at any time of day or night, I could text him at random times and he's right there. So I thank you much. I really appreciate it. Um, and we're honored to consider you and, and very worshipful Castle part of our SAC 40 family. Um, I also want to quickly thank the brothers of SAC 40 uh, who are always here to support the endeavors and who make an ever evolving Masonic program look seamless. Uh, I know things seem to change by the hour, and I'm proud and super fortunate to be surrounded with men who are willing to take the path least traveled in order to successfully execute any plan that we have uh, to propel us into the future of masonry. And uh, another group of people who I'd like to thank are our significant others who really kind of support us by giving us the time on Wednesday nights, two, three hours to really just to become better people because we're surrounded by better people. So. We can't do that without the support of our family who are, who are not, you know, who, who are saying, go ahead, I, I got you. So uh, that's amazing. Um, it, so, and, and thank you everybody else for joining us tonight. Uh, very worshipful, uh, worshipful sirs and, and dear brethren, please remember to follow us on all of our social media sources. And uh, Brother Green, if you could tell us how to do that right now is your time to shine. Absolutely. Um if any brother wants to keep up uh, with what we're doing, any other future events or speaker series, uh, Masons of SAC 40 on Instagram, on YouTube, and uh, SAC 40 on Facebook. We post all of the events. Um, all of our videos go up on our YouTube page. You can subscribe to that. And then, uh, of course, we post all of our events to our Facebook page, which you can get informed of about that, which also has our calendar. So you can link your Google calendar and get notified of all those things. Cheers, my brother. Very worshipful. Cheers. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. It's I appreciate been a real it. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, made definitely. my day. Awesome. Glad to hear yeah. that. So we'll definitely be in touch soon. Uh, and worshipful Gomez, again, thank you so much. And, and to the brothers, thank you. Love you guys. And uh, we'll be back to those quarries tomorrow morning. All right. <laughs>